I feel so honored to be talking to y'all today. I was a junior at Auburn, majoring in journalism, and I had just gotten a job on the school newspaper. So I had taken some interviews on my recorder for an article that was due, and then one weekend, I decided to go home to visit a friend of mine. So I went home, spent the weekend with her, had lunch with my family, and then started to head back towards campus. Well, I was I believe I was listening back to the interviews while driving because I was two exits away from campus and went clear across the median and head on with the pickup truck. The reason why I think I was listening to them back is because um, the entire accident was recorded, like everything. This country song I was listening to, to the gentleman saying, help us on the way, ma'am, to the sirens and the recording and the re ambulance. The only part that you don't hear, which is kind of strange, is the sound of the crash itself. So I must have clenched the record button upon impact with the truck. As a result, um, I sustained traumatic brain injury. I had diffuse axonal injury, which is where the brain shears or tears, and I was in a coma. Um, I did the damage to the left portion of my brain, and my entire right side was affected. So to this day, I can do minimal amounts with my right leg and nothing with my right, right arm. Now, while I was in that coma, I got transferred to Shepherd Center in Atlanta. It's a brain and spinal cord injury hospital, and I was there for about a month, and doctors came to my family and said, you know, we tried everything we can. She's not coming out of her coma or making any progress. We're gonna send her home with y'all. My family was shocked and they doctors reassured them that uh, sometimes when a patient goes home, certain scents and sounds can bring them right out. And that's exactly what happened to me. So one day I was just lying around my bed as usual, and my sister came in and started playing Bible songs, and I started mouthing along to the words. And another day, my father came in my room to stretch my right arm. Well, the pain was so intense, and I had no way of verbalizing it. So we started stretching my arm up like this, and I started to lean down towards his arm and just bit the heck out of him. <laughs> so he said, look, Molly, next time, just tell me to stop. <laughs> so the next time he came in my room to stretch my arm, I mouthed the word stop. And Shepherd Center sent me home with a webcam so they can watch our progress, or my progress, from their hospital. And once I was done mouthing the words, I do a couple more criteria, like pet my dog, brush my hair and teeth, raise one finger for yes, two for no, before I could go back there for more intense therapy. One of those intense therapies was speech therapy. It used to be where no one could understand me. And people are all so kind. They try their absolute hardest. They smile and nod and try to respond to what they thought I said. And at the time, it made no sense whatsoever. Um, another part is, so I had to go through a bunch of articulation and 
pronunciation exercises to get my speech sounding kind of normal. Um, another part of speech therapy was I had to relearn how to swallow. I used to have to eat pureed food or ground up food like baby food. And being 21 at the time, that was not okay. <laughs> I had to drink my pitas out of a cup. Another intense therapy was physical. I went from the bed to a real wheelchair to a walker to a cane. And I keep thinking I've gotten rid of this cane because I walk a couple steps without it and start devising ways on how to burn it. <laughs> but I've never come up with a good way yet. So the next intense therapy was occupational. That's where they work on your arms. Uh, they used to try all these exercises on my right arm to get it to reawaken, um, including this one where they put these little chakra devices on it. But it never did wake up, so it was super upsetting. But on a good note, I'll talk about AU. All right, so I had to finish what I started. So my electives, I could take anywhere. So I just took them online. But my core classes, I had to take at Auburn. That was really hard considering I didn't drive. Um, but my professors only made me go once a week and then make up for the other class I was missing right afterwards. And then my family all took turns driving me down there. But it was an all-day event. It took two and a half hours to get down there, and then I waited in for an hour and a half of class, and then two and a half hours back. So it took me a good extra three years, um, but I finally walked across the stage to receive my diploma. Then it took another three to find a part-time job. And I was there for about 10 months, and I started to get an idea. Why not use experiences to help others avoid all this fun and exciting stuff that I had to go through? <laughs> so I took Uber to Starbucks one day, and I started to have a conversation with a business owner. And he's from New Tech Solutions, and he has a software that uses mostly texting. What he wanted to do was say, you can text us, but just not while you drive. So he said to me, me and my other business owner can help you create a public service announcement. They are both called A Second Later, and you can find them on Facebook and Twitter. It's just A Second Later, one word. I thought that New Tech also helped me create a nonprofit motivational speaking company. It's called A Second Later. I talk to many schools because it's important to get my message across as there are no new drivers. I also talk to the legislation to try to help them get, adopt a new bill that makes people go hands-free. I've talked to the Medical Association of Atlanta and Georgia. My PSA runs in several cities in order to promote the message against distracted driving. If I can just save one life, then all this hard work will be all worth it. There are many ways people can become distracted. It wasn't a text in my case, but it is in many. It's been a decade now, and my life 
so revolves around this wreck. I think about it 24-7. I don't want to, but I've got to. So we all see people driving distracted every day of our lives. So let's agree that what's on the books is not working. I mean, how many people are we going to have to see die or become permanently disabled before the law is changed? So I could tell you about the hours upon hours I spend waiting on transportation, or I could tell you about the fact that I was dominant on my right side and had to relearn how to do everything single-handedly on my left. Or I could tell you that I used to have such a passion for running. It gave me so much joy and freedom. And unless technology keeps going at the rate that it has been going, I will never run again. I think that the penalties for distracted driving should be made so severe that people will never forget the day they drove distracted. What are y'all going to do? Are y'all going to focus more on the road? Are you going to put your all your electronic devices out of reach? Are y'all going to put both hands on the wheel and um, buckle up? It's a choice. Please make the correct one. And in 2015, 3,477 people died due to distracted driving. That was like the size of my high school. Thankfully, I was not one of the ones who died, but I was one of the 390,000 that were injured. It's not worth it. Um, I don't know how to be more straightforward than that. Um, my hope is that you all drive as safely as possible and live happy and successful lives.